The time is now. Imagine your mother or father has suffered a heart attack. Deprived of its vital blood supply, a part of their heart is dying. Or imagine your grandmother or grandfather lying nearly motionless in their nursing home bed. Advanced age complicated by pneumonia is about to end their lives. Or imagine a close friend has just entered the hospital with a massive system-wide infection. AIDS has left their body ravaged by multiple diseases. For most people, these circumstances would herald the end of life. Today's medicine can no longer help them. But all of you may be able to meet again in the far future. Does this sound like science fiction? Perhaps. But it may one day be possible. How? Through the process of cryonics. Cryonics is the process of freezing human beings after death in the hope that medical science will be able to revive them in the future. Intrigued by the prospect of being cryonically frozen, I've spent some time researching the subject of cryonics. After reading dozens of newspaper and magazine articles, I would like to give you a brief overview of the history, methods, and future of cryonics. Let's start with the development of cryonics. Although the idea of freezing people is a new idea, the notion of preserving them is old. In the 1770s, for example, Ben Franklin wrote that he wanted to be immersed in a cask of Madeira wine till that time when he could be recalled to life. It was not to be, but Franklin's dream, at least, lived on to be revived in our time as cryonics. Cryonics has been a staple of science fiction novels, the plot device in numerous movies such as Austin Powers and Sleepers, and the subject of countless newspaper and magazine articles. Until 1964, however, cryonics remained firmly in the realm of fiction. It was at this time that physics professor Robert Ettinger argued in the book The Prospect of Immortality that cryonics was indeed possible. Three years later, January 12, 1967, 73-year-old James H. Bedford became the first human being to be frozen. Ever since Bedford was frozen, cryonics has steadily increased in popularity. Currently, there are four cryonic institutions in the United States, two in California and one each in Michigan and Arizona. So far, 80 people have already been frozen from around the world, and another estimated 800 have signed up to be frozen when they die. Their aim is to remain frozen in a state of suspended animation, perhaps for centuries, in the hope that medical science will be able to revive them in the future, at a time when cures exist for virtually all of today's diseases, and when restoration to full function and health is possible. So you're probably wondering, how will they do it? How does cryonics work? Currently, when a person who has signed up to be cryonically suspended dies, a specific procedure, which was outlined in the book, Cryonics, Reaching for Tomorrow, must be carried out. First, before death, an individual must decide whether to have the entire body frozen or just the head. If the whole body is to be frozen, it must be preserved upon death, immediately after death, ideally within a matter of minutes. The patient is connected to a heart-lung machine, and chemicals such as glucose and heparin are circulated with the oxygenated blood to help minimize the freezing damage. At the same time, the patient's internal temperature is reduced as quickly as possible using cold packs. If only the head will be frozen, a slightly different procedure must be carried out. The head must be surgically detached from the rest of the body and preserved in a separate container. You may be wondering, why would I only preserve my head? The answer is, with some diseases, the body is left in a very poor condition. If this is the case and you choose only to preserve your head, you do so with the belief that medical science will be able to create a healthy new body for you in the future. Once the head or body is ready for freezing, a liquid called a cryoprotectant, which works as an antifreeze of sorts to help prevent cell damage, is circulated through the body or head. Over a 20-day period, the patient is prepared for long-term storage by cooling the body or head to a temperature of negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. When this temperature is reached, the patient is stored in a steel cylinder of liquid nitrogen. According to an article in Omni Magazine, at this temperature, biological function ceases and the patient will remain unchanged for hundreds of years. Now that we've explored the development of cryonics and how the freezing process works, you may wonder about questions such as how much it costs and whether people that are frozen can really be rethought. According to an article in Fortune Magazine, the cost of cryonic suspension ranges from $60,000 to $125,000. It can be creatively paid for by making the cryonic institution the beneficiary on your life insurance policy. These costs may seem rather steep, but as one cryonics member states, facing my own mortality turned out to be much harder than coming up with the cash to pay for the life insurance premiums. The cost is not the only issue. Even if you can afford the cost of being chronically frozen, scientists have not yet worked out all of the details involved with freezing and rethawing. As explained by New Scientist magazine, 
The problem is that the freezing process itself inflicts a crippling amount of cellular damage by dehydrating cells and puncturing their delicate membranes. So far, there are only a few types of human tissue that can be successfully frozen and rethawed, including sperm, embryos, and bone marrow, which contain relatively few cells. It is not yet possible to freeze and rethaw complicated organs such as the heart or liver, not to mention a complete body or brain. What scientists need is a procedure that will allow them to reduce the damage inflicted by the freezing process. And in fact, scientists are currently working on this procedure. Research is being done in the hope of finding better cryoprotectants or antifreezes, which will reduce the cell damage caused by freezing. According to the book, Cryonics Reaching for Tomorrow, scientists are also developing microscopic machines that are capable of repairing cells at the molecular level. These machines might one day make it possible to repair the cell damage caused by the freezing process and thus bring frozen patients back to full life. Until that time, the people that are already frozen will have to remain in their current state of suspended animation in the hopes that science will one day work out solutions to the problems involved with freezing and rethawing. In closing, we have seen that Cryonics is much more than a plot in a science fiction novel. It has developed from a wholly unrealistic fantasy to the point that 80 people have already been frozen and hundreds more have made the choice to be cryonically frozen when they die. If scientists can ever figure out how to freeze and rethaw people successfully, we can be sure that cryonics will become much more popular. So think again of your father or mother suffering a heart attack, your grandmother or grandfather dying of pneumonia, or your close friends stricken with AIDS. If they chose to be buried or cremated in traditional fashion, their physical minds and bodies would be destroyed. That is absolutely certain. By contrast, being cryonically frozen offers some small chance that they may be revived in the future. Even if this chance is small, it is more than no chance at all.